Welcome to the virtual panel discussion, Tech Innovations in National Security. Today's event is hosted by the Georgetown Technology Alliance and the Georgetown University Alumni Association. Thank you for taking time out of your day to connect virtually with fellow Hoyas from around the world. I'm Stephanie Seitz, Director of Professional Alliances here at Georgetown, and I will be facilitating today's webinar. Before we get started, I'd like to share a few tips and reminders. This conversation is being recorded. The recording will be made available on our YouTube channel and you will receive the recording link in a follow-up email. The group will take questions at the end of the panel discussion. Please send in your questions as you have them using the questions section of the webinar control panel. If you are having any technical difficulties or other issues, please submit these concerns via the questions section of the control panel as well. Today's moderator, Trey Stevens, is a 2006 graduate of Georgetown School of Foreign Service and a partner at Founders Fund, where he invests across sectors with a particular interest in startups operating in the government space. In addition, he is also the co-founder and executive chairman of Anduril Industries, a defense technology company focused on autonomous systems. Trey is a board member of the Georgetown Technology Alliance and has led the effort to bring this topic and group of panelists together for our Georgetown community today. Without any further ado, I'm pleased to turn things over to Trey. Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, we're so honored and pleasured to be able to uh, do this panel and uh, want to thank the, the panelists for joining me today. Um, I'll quickly go through an introduction and we will be as efficient as possible and kind of diving into the questions from there. Um, so I don't know where everyone else sees on the screen, but Mike Brown, if you can wave. Uh, Mike is the director of the Defense Innovation Unit uh, and prior to government service, he was the CEO of Symantec, which is one of the 10 largest software companies in the world and has a long history of work in the technology industry. Um, Catherine Boyle, if you want to wave Catherine, Catherine is a partner at one of the world's premier venture capital firms, General Catalyst. She's also an 08 Georgetown alum. Prior to entering the tech community, she was a reporter for the Washington Post, which is honestly kind of a unique path into venture capital, but I think that it lends her having a tremendously different perspective uh, that is, is super cool to see in the tech uh, industry. Jason Metheny, Metheny um, uh, if you want to wave Jason, Jason is the founding director of Georgetown Center for Security and Emerging Technology. Uh, prior to landing at the Hilltop, Jason was assistant director for national intelligence as well as director of the Intelligence Advanced Research Projects Agency, or IARPA for short. Um, so thank, thank all of you for joining us today. I know that um, you know, there's a tremendous amount of Zoom fatigue in the era of COVID, and the last thing you need is another webinar. But here we are in another webinar. So, um, Mike, why don't you kick us off? Uh, obviously, like, you know, the history of Silicon Valley uh, and the tech community intersecting with the Defense Department is long and storied. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that and also tell us about the Defense Innovation about Unit, how it started, and what, it, and what you guys are doing? Sure. Well, a lot's changed since uh, the 1960s and 70s when the Defense uh, Department was really the funder uh, behind getting Silicon Valley started. And in fact, of course, that's how Silicon Valley got its name from the semiconductor industry. In fact, uh, I read a statistic that said about a third of semiconductor output in the 1960s went to the space program. So it's interesting to think about a time when defense um, was really leading the technology development and its biggest customer. So as we know, uh, in the subsequent uh, 40 years or so, uh, really commercial uh, technology has really become the leaders in Silicon Valley. Uh, and defense is really a lagging customer at this point. So in that uh, process, uh, it became apparent that there was a need to get the Defense Department much closer to what was going on with leading edge commercial technology, especially as a lot of these commercial technologies like AI, like autonomous systems, like cyber are really dual use and their primary use is commercial and their secondary use would be for, for national security. So that's why about four and a half years ago, then Secretary Ash Carter decided to form the Defense Innovation Unit, uh, which I lead today. And the idea was, how do we make sure that that commercial technology uh, gets incorporated into the military. The military has access to it. So there's three missions that Defense Innovation Unit has today. The first is accelerating that adoption of commercial technology. The second is bringing new capabilities to defense. How can we transform uh, the capabilities the Defense Department has access to? 
Then the third is really uh, fostering and growing something that the National Defense Strategy calls National Security Innovation Base, which basically means that uh, for the Defense Department to have access to leading technology, we've got to look beyond the prime uh, uh, contractors, the names we all know about and associate with defense, to all the innovative companies, the, uh, the entrepreneurs, the investor ecosystem uh, that uh, Catherine and Trey, you guys represent, uh, so that we can see what's happening on a, on a broader perspective and make sure that defense has access to that. So what we try and do is lower the barriers so that uh, those smaller, more innovative companies won't view it so daunting as a task to, uh, to supply the Defense Department. So lower those barriers. The aspirational goal would be to make defense an easy customer to do business with. We have a lot of work to do to make that a reality. We do about 35 projects a year. We influence about half a billion dollars of procurement. And uh, our goal is to try and get companies on contract within 60 to 90 days. So some of the things that we're doing to fulfill that mission of accelerating commercial technology uh, into the Defense Department. All right, yeah. For those of you that have intersected uh, watching the webinar with the defense technology ecosystem, you, you are undoubtedly familiar with the work of DIU. Um, and the importance that it's played to the ecosystem. Um, so Catherine, let, let's transition to you. So obviously like the last 30 years, uh, we have, well, I guess 27 of the last 30 years, we have not had the Defense Innovation Unit. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the history of post-Cold War uh, intersection between defense and tech, um, where the gaps exist, and how venture capital as an asset class should play in uh, with this ecosystem? Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, I think the, the first thing to say is that defense did a lot of things right post-World War II. So, you know, privatization was the best aspect of this. You know, during World War II, the government couldn't continue to build technology for, for defense. And so it, it outsourced it to large defense contractors, which has kind of grown this, this industrial base that we have. The main problem that it happened after the Cold War is that there was a movement to what I would call anti-competitive behavior and consolidation among the big five primes. Something like 17,000 companies left the defense sector or were acquired during the 90s. Um, and when you compare that to any other large industry, um, you know, I spend a lot of time with internet companies, but, but let's just talk about something like biotech. Uh, the small companies are actually where you get a lot of the research and development. Um, and that's what private equity, that's what venture capital does. It spurs this investment in research and development that can then be acquired. And what was happening in the defense sector is that acquisitions were happening among companies that had contracts, not necessarily companies that were building new technologies. So you see this bloating of the big five prime contractors, and that doesn't necessarily mean that there's been improvements in research and development and that there's been improvements in the technologies acquired. Um, and so I think that has been the reason why since the Cold War, we're at near peer status with Russia and China, uh, where, com where countries that have been able to invest in research and development and force companies to work on defense uh, products um, have been much more successful than the, the prime contractors that, necess that haven't necessarily been able to acquire the technologies needed for this 21st century defense. Great, thanks. And so we've talked about the government responsibility and the venture capital private sector responsibility. Jason, why, why don't you tell us about the role of academia in this discussion and Tell us a little bit more about the Center for Security and Emerging Technology as well. Yeah, thanks. Um, so universities and colleges uh, play a key role in defense innovation. Uh, last year, uh, DOD spent uh, about eight and a half billion dollars on basic and applied research, and about two thirds of that went to universities. So that includes grants and contracts for academic research, but it also includes $2 billion in DOD funding for university affiliated research centers that are focused on DOD missions, of which there are about 15 across the country. Uh, DOD plays a, a key role in several academic fields. About 40% of university uh, research and development funding for aero-astro engineering comes from DOD as is about 40% of funding for electrical engineering and about a quarter of funding for all university-based research on computer science and in material science also comes from DOD. So DOD has a, a huge role in university research. Universities have a huge role in defense research. 
And it's also true that universities play a key role in performing research on defense research. Uh, that is in studying uh, the process of defense innovation. So people like Bill Bonvillian at MIT, uh, Erica Fuchs at uh, Carnegie Mellon uh, do some of the best work to understand how our defense innovation system works, um, how it operates, how it's changed over time. And uh, as, as sort of in line with, with that kind of work, the, the research that we do at Georgetown's Center for Security and Emerging Technology uh, has two lines of effort. Um, so first, a, uh, a sort of unclassified assessment of foreign capabilities and emerging technologies, how they compare to U.S. capabilities, how they could be applied in ways that uh, challenge national or international security. And then a second line of effort in policy analysis to support federal leaders and policies related to research, technology procurement, technology trade, global talent, and technology standards. Uh, and as probably all uh, viewers know, DC has no shortage of think tanks. Uh, but I think the, the main differentiators for the work that we're doing is uh, expertise in AI and computing, a large translation pipeline, especially for Chinese documents, and a data science team that works with large volumes of publication, patent, and workforce data. Back to you, Trey. Great. Thank you. Um, so, Mike, kind of tying that that end back to the government side of things, how are you, how are you and your uh, your team at the Defense Innovation Unit thinking about the importance of pulling people out of the university setting, whether it's out of undergrad or grad schools, into uh, both internal government projects as well as private companies working with the defense community um, and retaining that talent over time. Well, we're uh, pleased to see that uh, there is emerging uh, really a fusion of the fields of uh, engineering, technology development, and national security. So I would say that before these disciplines were very separate or siloed, and now we're starting to see uh, more st students and programs that really combine these because uh, technology is so key to national security as we go forward. As, as you know, I think Jason's comments just illustrate, we need more folks with technical expertise coming into government that could work uh, in a variety of uh, different places so we have more informed policy decisions. So we're continuing to look for how can we attract folks uh, with that kind of background, both to DIU and one of the components of DIU is an organization called National Security Innovation Network, explicitly with the goal of how do we create uh, additional pathways for national service. So I'll give you a couple of quick examples. Maybe the most, most well-known uh, offering of that group is Hacking for Defense. A course that's offered at Georgetown as well as about uh, 40 other universities across the country. And this is really an opportunity to work on a real problem curated mm -hmm. by the Defense Department and bring in students at graduate and undergraduate level to really work on teams to see what progress could be made to solve one of those challenges. So I just participated in one of those this week at Stanford where Secretary Mattis uh, came and spoke. Uh, so that's been a very popular course. Uh, there's also some fellowship programs that uh, National Security Innovation Network has uh, formed. Uh, we have been recruiting at Georgetown for something called the X-Force Fellowship. So this would be uh, bringing three to five students together that embed at a DOD installation uh, with a problem and uh, they spend uh, a number of weeks coming up with a minimum viable product or uh, solution at a pretty low TRL level, technology readiness level, if you know that uh, nomenclature. But the ideas have been adopted about 70% of the time, so pretty good success rate for those students that embed. Then this year we started a National Security and Technology Fellowship where eight students will be placed uh, four at the Pentagon and four in congressional offices working on national security issues. So really important area. We need to create more pathways for service and frankly, over time, make it a more permeable membrane between uh, the private sector and government so that we could have people at different stages in their career moving back and forth. I think that would be very beneficial for, for the government. Yeah. And Jason, you know, as an 06 grad of the School of Foreign Service where uh, we colloquially called it safe from science. Um, 
increasing the pathway of, of technical expertise into the government seems to like send shivers down the spines of many Georgetown people. Um, where do you think, like what strategic advantage would you say that Georgetown as an institution or Georgetown students as individuals have when, it, when they have an interest in getting into this defense innovation uh, marketplace? Yeah, I, you know, I think without an engineering school, Georgetown doesn't produce as many technology makers as MIT or Stanford or some other schools, but we probably produce more technology policy makers uh, than many other schools. And we do have some of the country's strongest programs in foreign service, security studies, policy, uh, and law. And Georgetown alumni are just everywhere in government. I mean, especially in the State Department, the National Security Council, Congress, the intelligence community. So I think in, in areas of national security strategy and policy, international technology policy and technology law, uh, Georgetown is, is in a leading position nationally. Um, CSAT, the, the place where I work, is the largest university research center that's focused on technology policy and national security. Um, the School of Foreign Service has a uh, concentration in science and technology and international affairs, which is now the biggest concentration in the school. And Georgetown's Law Center has by far the largest technology law program in the country. So I think for people who are interested in the intersection of uh, policy and technology or policy and innovation, Georgetown is a great home. Uh, and we, we desperately need uh, more students and more faculty to be pursuing these topics. We need more policy and law students and faculty who are interested in technology, and we need more STEM students and faculty who are interested in, in policy and law. Yeah, and you know, on, on that kind of university intersection, Catherine, with your unique background uh, in the media, um, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention corporate and campus activism as being part of this conversation around getting the best talent uh, working on national security problems. What do you think is the role of, of the media in, uh, you know, serving as the, the an, uh, an additional estate to keep this in check? And how would you, you know, talk about those topics to students that are interested in, in entering this space? You know, this is sort of the, the question of the moment. And if you had asked me this question two weeks ago, I probably would have had a different answer because we're watching all of the major publications from the New York Times, Philadelphia Inquirer, uh, essentially fire op-ed editors who've been there 20 years or executive editors who've been there 20 years for sort of this question of what is the role of media? And I think if you look at the difference between the Washington press, I was a reporter at the Washington Post uh, and you know most of that is political reporting. There's a very different understanding of defense in Washington than there is in say the tech press in San Francisco. Um, and also a different philosophy of what it means to be part of the press. I'd say that the tech press in San Francisco very much takes an advocacy approach. Um, and one of the things that we've seen um, investing in defense is that you know, the Washington press corps very much understands that uh, defense is a bipartisan issue, that the rise of uh, dominant China is a bipartisan issue, that Republicans and Democrats alike are worried about security threats, and it's something that we should all take very seriously. Whereas I think on the West Coast, there's a, a very different view of what it means to be involved in security. And there's a very different view of what it means also to be a journalist asking questions of tech companies. And what I think is most important right now is we have to make sure that there's a conversation happening between defense companies and the, the tech press. I've held many of those conversations off the record because I think there is a misunderstanding of the political system behind investing in defense and also you know, making sure that acquisitions happen in a certain way. So I think there has to be an education because otherwise it becomes very much a political question um, and an advocacy question. And I think that the vast majority of tech reporters are not schooled in, in the politics of procurement or even the politics of security. And what would, what would your pitch be to students who have been kind of inundated with the, the you know, kind of monocular view uh, into what this conversation is like and why, why it's important to, to think about doing it anyway? Yeah, I mean, what's pleasantly surprising to me is that the, the vast majority of engineers that I meet want to work on problems in defense. I actually think there's sort of this media narrative mirage, if you will, that people do not believe in investing in defense. I think that is, a, or, or working on defense problems. There's a, a small minority of people who object 
uh, to anything defense related, but, but the vast majority of, of engineers want to work on hard problems. They, they, they see national security as incredibly important. Um, and, and to the people who don't, I think it's incredibly important to, to remind people of and, and reframe this conversation in terms of human rights. Uh, when I talk about the rise of, of China, uh, particularly in Silicon Valley, it, it's, it's, it's shocking to me how many people ignore the question of you know, a million Uyghurs uh, in Xinjiang province being imprisoned by artificial intelligence and by tech companies that are being used in order to oppress a religious minority. The vast majority of students on campuses across the US disagree with that kind of behavior and want to live in a, in a country and want to see the world um, embrace minorities and embrace human rights that we all believe in. And so I, I think the, the question of investing in defense and also making sure that the US is the leader in terms of the ethics of defense is something that you know anyone across the political spectrum can agree with given the atrocities that we're seeing and in places like in places like China, when it comes to minority populations. Yeah. The, so the next question I want to open up to everyone on the panel, um, kind of a, a more abstract, looser topic. Um, what does the future of defense look like? What are the emerging technologies that we need to work on? And I think, aside from just kind of the the science fiction discussion of those topics existing, what are the ethical struggles that we will need to work through alongside that? Um, one kind of very proximate example this week is um, IBM and Amazon both announcing that they were, for at least for a limited time, going to stop selling facial recognition technology to law enforcement agencies. The Amazon one I get, the IBM one, it's like you're telling them you're not going to sell a technology that you didn't build anyway. Uh, that's kind of a head scratcher to me. But uh, um, we'd love to hear from you guys, like, you know, what does the, what does the future look like and how do we approach it? Oh, Go ahead, Mike. Take a stab at that at the start. I think there's a recognition that uh, there's a change in the composition of the force that uh, that is coming. And by that, I mean, we need to be investing in some of the uh, asymmetric uh, technologies. Uh, we see that China has very successfully invested in that neutralize uh, many of our capabilities. So that means a lot more dual use technologies. We have to figure out how they are successfully deployed. So artificial intelligence being a good example of that. Uh, being masters at cyber, uh, autonomous systems are going to be key because uh, our large platforms now become vulnerable to missiles. Uh, so I think there's a composition that needs to, uh, a change that needs to occur so that we're developing a lot more leading edge capabilities rather than uh, the large capacity of forces that we have today, which would be, you know, uh, symbolized by very large numbers of ships in the fleet, very large army, et cetera. So I think there's an opportunity to um, really invest where defense needs to be investing is uh, how can we be on the forefront of these new technologies uh, in the future? A good example of where we've uh, not done that is hypersonics, uh, where we let the Chinese uh, get an advantage, hopefully temporary. My boss, Mike Griffin, spending a lot of his energy on how does the US take the lead again in hypersonics. Another one that's a dual use technology, 5G. Uh, we've not done the things as a country that we need to do, and communications is one of those must-win technology areas where the U.S. needs to be at the forefront. So we have to recognize that uh, there needs to be some investment in these areas again, uh, just like we had uh, during the Cold War, where we take the lead on these game-changing technologies. And most of those game-changing technologies are going to be commercial technologies uh, that are dual use. To, to add Catherine to what Jason, uh, Mike ahead, said, I, I think the future could be really, really weird. Um, there's the there's a line about how we tend to overestimate change in the short run and underestimate in the long run. Um, but I, I think with um, with synthetic biology, especially, I think a lot of the um, the security challenges that we'll have in, in, in the coming decades um, will be very complicated. Um, and so I, I see biosecurity as a, as a key place to be making investments. Um, I came into national security from international health and epidemiology. And the thing that, that triggered me to move to national security was in 2002 when the first virus was synthesized from scratch. It's sort of an oh crap moment um, for the global health community because we realized that you know some sophisticated misanthrope could decide to reintroduce smallpox or something much, much worse 
Um, so I, I worry a lot about that. I think um, we're going to see some very creative applications of AI as well uh, in the next few decades. Um, so I think investing in AI security, but also in ways of, of, uh, of spoofing AI systems, of breaking AI systems in the wild is going to be an important area for, for investment. And on, on the acquisition and procurement side, I mean, I, I think that the work that, that Mike is doing is sort of the role model for how to create a more agile organization uh, that can invest in innovation when we need it, where we need it, rather than you know these massive 20 year programs that ultimately deliver a technology that is highly perishable. Um, so I, I think we just need more of, of, of DIU. <laughs> Thank you. Catherine? Yeah, I mean, to, to build off that, I mean, I agree with all of the, the you know, unique technologies that we should be building, but, but to build off Jason's point, uh, you know, the pace of technology creation and the acceleration that we've seen, and even the path to market we see on the commercial side of where you can, you know, go from zero to a $30 billion company in seven years, uh, that's just going to continue. Um, you know, we just inject, injected $4 trillion into the economy. The cost of capital has never been lower. And investment on the commercial side is so high. We could see another decade of just incredible innovation in technology. And we have to understand that that means that, again, to the 20-year programs, by the time that these products that, that Lockheed and Raytheon are building come to, come to fruition, technology is going to be so far ahead. And so I think we, we have to think about how we're building, how we're productizing, and how we're moving at, at a pace that's competitive, as well as the types of products that we're building. You know, one, one of the other things I think we have to confront as a country is how do we uh, complement the tremendous effort that's been put on acquisition reform with budget process reform? So uh, we move so slow in terms of planning for what the Defense Department is going to spend on that we've pretty much institutionalized the 12 to 18 month delay between when you might have an idea for what you need to spend on, or as Catherine points out, a technology that you see is becoming mature from, from a startup, and when you could actually get that fielded. So we have to be able to address that, and that's a complicated question because it has to do with congressional oversight and wanting to see very detailed line item forecasts from DOD, which start two years uh, before the spending starts. So that kind of slow process that's not agile at all uh, is not in keeping with making sure leading edge technology and some of these innovative companies that uh, we see out in the marketplace can get their solutions to the military on a timely basis. And our adversaries are not constrained by a, a long uh, history and oversight process uh, that we now have come to accept in the US. What would each of you say is the like one thing that the decision makers inside of the DoD do not understand about the innovation ecosystem? I, I can start there um, from the venture capital perspective. One of the things that I'm constantly doing when I when I have meetings in Washington is explaining why it's so difficult. Uh, to get private investors excited about investing in defense companies, given just the track record of how defense companies are built. Um, you know, Trey, you and I have talked about this many, many times, but we're at funds that are multi-billion dollar funds, and we need to see companies of a certain scale uh, in order to return the fund. It's, you know, and, and, and in defense, a lot of these uh, uh, that, that happen. Uh, hey, Palmer. <laughs> Hi. Hi, everybody. Hi, Georgetown people. Hi, Mike. <laughs> hey there, Paul. We were, we were just talking about uh, defense acquisitions. Um, but a number of these acquisitions that happen are at a scale that just aren't interesting for the venture capital community. You know, for in order to return our funds, we need to see 10, 20 billion dollar companies being built in this sector because they take so much capital. Um, and, and we need to see a return for our institutional LPs, some of them are the likes of Georgetown and universities that, that give that money to scholarships. So we really need to see companies of a certain scale. And when you look at the history of venture-backed defense companies, you know, aside from SpaceX and Palantir, in the last 15 years, there haven't been any companies that would meet our return threshold as investors. And so in order to get the Silicon Valley community excited about investing in defense, and making sure that the best technologists and the best technologists are being sold to defense uh, or, or to the DOD, we, we have to believe that there's going to be a, a certain type of speed 
and a certain type of scale that these companies can achieve. Um, and we haven't seen that historically. I think we're hopeful. I mean, what, what Michael, what you're doing with DIU and, and what we're hearing out of the Defense Department is that that is changing, that there's a need for larger companies specifically around AI and computer vision. Uh, but we're hopeful that, that we're going to see more of them and that procurement reform will allow for these companies to grow. I think the one dollar thing I've heard is pretty is, good start. Been, that's been surprising for folks uh, at, in, in DC is that they don't sort of own the um, they they don't own the problem set uh, the way that they used to um, and you know when they when they want advice on you know what's happening in autonomy their first impulse is to go to a large defense contractor and and ask them whereas they they should be you know either asking Trey and Palmer or they should be asking OpenAI or they should be asking DeepMind. Uh, about what the future of AI looks like. In, instead, they're going to traditional contractors. And I think that's uh, that's something that's slowly changing, but too slowly, because I think the the technical advice that the Pentagon is getting is um, a few years out of date. Um, and then the other thing I think uh, that I've, uh, I think, um, I've found surprising is the degree to which um, the, um, the, the political process uh, surrounding budget and acquisition is so deeply entrenched and uh, it's it's really complicated. Um, uh, we were just talking uh, before we started about Chris Brose's book, The Kill Chain, which gives, I think, sort of the best description I've heard of, of both the history and the bureaucracy as it exists today of that process. And I, I don't know how to fix that, but that does seem really fundamental uh, so that we can we can have uh, more agile and, and flexible procurement of the technologies that we need. I, I would uh, uh, double down on the points that Catherine made, that the two issues that I see uh, that Defense Department leaders should really in, uh, uh, take to heart is speed and scale. So speed, we all know tech is moving very fast. Defense typically does not. But to incorporate these new technologies, we've got to move at a faster speed in defense. And scale is, I appreciate all the nice things that have been said about DIU, but we're not at a scale that's really affecting uh, defense procurement in the macro sense, nor are we big enough, as, as Catherine alluded to, to really change investors or entrepreneurs' minds about defense needs being incorporated into their business plan. So DIU's influencing about half a billion a year but the Defense Department spends 250, 300, 350 billion a year in procurement. So we're influencing well under 1%. So because commercial dual use technology is gonna be so important for the future, the Defense Department needs to figure out how can it accelerate its plans to be working with much broader set of commercial vendors. That's what DIU was set up to do, but it's not happening at the scale that I think can make a, real, make a much bigger difference, a difference that needs to be made at defense. I think anecdotally, one of my favorite moments over the last year has been uh, Secretary Esper did an interview with, I think it was Morgan Brennan at CNBC, uh, in which he said, the top priority for the department is integrating AI into our operations. Um, and I have directed uh, $1 billion of budget to go into AI in fiscal year 2020. And, you know, I'm sitting there scratching my head like, wait, isn't the DOD budget $730 billion? <laughs> like, wow, $1 billion might seem like a lot, but as a percentage of the total spend, maybe it's, it's not so large after all. Um, Stephanie, are there questions from the, the peanut gallery that you'd like us for, for us to cover? Yeah, yep. Here's one. Uh, what does technology or tech need to change in regard to its storytelling and how the tech and defense industries work together? Crickets. <laughs> Mike, I think there's probably a Google Maven thing here uh, that, that could play into it. Yeah, I, mean, um, I would just say like there's there's so many spinoffs um, from defense research uh, that have you know applications that have transformed the world. The internet is is the one that that people you know point to most frequently. But I mean, if you look at everything from GPS to Mac, most of the vaccine development that we have today is due to you know investments that the Army 
uh, Research Institute for Infectious Diseases made decades ago, and we're still uh, leveraging the legacy of, of those investments. Um, so I, I just think the, the, the positive stories of spillover effects from defense R&D is something that needs to be told in a compelling way because uh, it's it's real and it has um, it's transformed the world in ways that are so profoundly positive for most of us. Yeah, and, well, and to add that just go, ahead. Go, ahead. go ahead, Catherine. To add on it from the the storytelling component, um, I was I was reading recently that Quentin Tarantino said that the most important movie of the last ten years was The Social Network. Um, and I actually agree with that uh, because I think, you know, I, I was at Georgetown when Facebook was started and, you know, no one was really thinking about technology. You didn't have young people in their dorm rooms building at a mass scale. And this movie comes out and we have a decade of young people deciding that they want to go into entrepreneurship. I very much believe that we need stories that show people how extraordinary it is to work on defense companies and, and that defense is cool. And sometimes all it takes is, is one film, one story, one success story. And particularly in Silicon Valley among investors, we're so mimetic and kind of herd like, where if we see one company doing well, we'll invest in every other company in the sector. So I think we need that example of just an extraordinary outcome to convince investors and, and young people alike that this is a sector they should spend time in. Yeah, uh, building on your point, Trey, about the storytelling, uh, I think that, uh, we need to give uh, the entrepreneurs, investors, and uh, the public at large uh, more of a view into uh, what is the work of the Defense Department. So a lot of the work that we're doing, uh, some on um, uh, algorithms that improve our understanding of image images, so AI applied to imagery is being used for humanitarian assistance, disaster relief. So we've got a project ongoing right now, which is helping California firefighters it was used for uh, hurricane relief uh, because we can look at uh, satellite imagery and actually project uh, what is the effect of the disaster, the fire, the flooding, and point first responders to uh, the paths of the infrastructure that has survived versus that which wouldn't have. So that's just one example. Uh, in the Project Maven example that you referenced, this was about um, uh, trying to use um, uh, in, intelligence AI to understand the pixels uh, that we see. We have, you know, millions of images that we don't even have the ability to understand because today that uh, the, the way to do that is have humans sit there and look at those uh, pictures. Uh, this immediately got translated into killer robots uh, and um, Lieutenant General uh, Jack Shanahan, who uh, led this project, would tell you that we're so far away from Killer robots is a technology that uh, it, it's uh, it's almost laughable. I, we all understand the concern that people would have with that, but that's really not where we are. It's not where the technology is. Um, so this is really just trying to be a productivity tool uh, for those folks who spend hours looking at pixels, so they can spend more time analyzing what they're seeing uh, and actually deliver real intelligence versus just looking at the pixels themselves and, and trying to make sense of it. So there's so many areas where technology just will be a tremendous boost to the productivity of doing something that is very manual, um, something where the technology is being used is 20 years old, uh, that uh, anyone who would uh, look at how the Defense Department is doing its work would be motivated by how can we help these folks uh, do their job better. There's a lot that could be done here with the storytelling. Yeah, on the killer robot point, if uh, if anyone wants a, a good laugh, uh, go on YouTube and look up the DARPA bipedal robot gag reel. It is it's truly special. Lots of falling robots and uh, demonstration of just how far away we are. Uh, Stephanie, any other questions? Yep, yep. Here's one: Is private sector investment enough for the United States when competitors like China have publicly committed to spending upwards of 30 billion and doing whatever it takes to leading the world in the development of AI and related technologies? Go ahead, Mike. I'd, I'd love to start this. It really builds off Jason's uh, answer to the last question. So clearly, no, uh, private sector investment is not enough. Uh, we can take a lesson here from the Cold War uh, not that we want to envision ourselves in another Cold War, and I actually don't think that's a great analogy for the competition we're in with China. Uh, 
because it's really an economic competition, not a military one. But uh, the investment that the United States made uh, in technologies uh, to support the space program, uh, uh, what we've done with uh, DARPA, uh, federal research at universities, we were spending 2% of our GDP in federally funded research in the 1960s. That's now declined to 0.7%. And, and those investments in technologies not only gave us the breakthroughs of GPS, internet, uh, miniaturized electronics, countless other foundational technologies on which a lot of our uh, prosperity is, uh, is built today. Uh, if we think about the uh, impact on the uh, innovation ecosystem that we had, all the uh, venture capitals and companies that have taken those and built new business models, new companies, uh, it's really phenomenal. So many of the companies today, I mean, Google was started with a National Science Foundation grant. So many of the companies we recognize as being leaders today started with some level of, of government support. So we have to recognize that this is what China is doing because they have an explicit goal to displace us uh, as a technology leader. 5G is just the tip of the iceberg. And we have to now redouble our efforts, commit to being preeminent in science and technology again, and there's an investment that goes along with that. There's a legislation that's just been uh, sponsored by Cameral and bipartisan, uh, Senator Schumer, Young, uh, Representatives Gallagher and Kana, that's called Endless Frontiers, which is a step in the right direction. A hundred billion dollars being targeted at the National Science Foundation to really uh, renew a commitment for basic research. And the key point uh, is what Jason made a minute ago. There's tremendous spillover effects economically. If we can create those breakthroughs, we create a foundation for economic prosperity for the next uh, several decades. And that's what we need to make sure that we can continue to lead from a technology and from a science uh, standpoint uh, relative to China. Yeah, and, and just, I mean, I agree with everything Michael just said, and, and but to, to add to it, I don't think we can do it without the private sector and without private investment. And there's a few reasons why. And Trey, I know you have a lot of thoughts here, so I'd love you to chime in. But not all talent is equal. The way that universities do research and the way that, that people who are dedicated to, to research and development do research is very different than the way that companies in Silicon Valley productize AI and computer vision in order to bring it to market and to make it into something that can be useful. And you know, that's in a very different skill set and that is what we need in terms of being able to bring technologies to market speedily um, it, to compete with with Russia and China. So I think it's important that we have uh, you know both public and private investment that that needs to continue and it needs to grow. But we have to understand that the types of people working in Silicon Valley companies move at a different pace, and there's a different level of talent and a different type of talent that works for equity. And we have to be mindful of that if we think that we're going to be able to, to be the, you know, the leaders in AI. Only one thing to add, I, I totally agree with both, with both uh, Mike and Catherine said. I think um, I'm, I'm bullish on the United States if we can get our act together because we do have some, some structural asymmetric advantages compared to China. Um, one is that we have friends in the world. Like we have true alliances that are are built on an appreciation of of core principles of democracy, and China doesn't have that advantage. It has sort of transactional relationships. Um, so building on our alliances, um, finding out ways of combining uh, research effort, uh, developing international standards around technology that are harmonized and uh, give advantages to democracy. Um, those are things that we can leverage. Combined, uh, the U.S. and its closest allies are responsible for two-thirds of global R&D spending. Um, so that's that's an enormous um, advantage that we have. The second is our ability to attract and retain global talent, uh, which which China doesn't have. There there are very few people, uh, especially scientists and engineers outside of China, who want to go and live and work in China. Um, so China has access to one and a half billion people. The United States has access to uh, everybody else, and that's uh, you know that's an incredible advantage of being able to attack you know six to six and a half billion people uh, worth of talent. Um, so I I do think these structural advantages are ones that uh, that even if China becomes a larger economy um, in GDP, it would be hard for China to compete on those terms as long as the U.S. can build on its strengths. 
Yeah, I would say there, there are probably two more things that I would add. The first is that while I agree with all of Jason's um, laying out of our systemic strengths, um, China also has some unique strengths related to authoritarianism. Um, the two uh, most proximate to my mind, at least, are uh, conscription. Uh, they can actually get people to work on the problems that they deem as being national security related. And the second is instruments of state power. Um, so the forcing of JVs for foreign, uh, foreign companies that relates to turnover of IP, um, being able to, you know, threaten exit bans to uh, families of people who are opposed to uh, ideas of the CCP. Georgetown actually is specifically uh, kind of stuck on this. Uh, I think two of our students are exit banned right now in China after they went back to, I think, their grandmother's wedding or something crazy like that. Um, and so there are instruments of state power uh, that create a kind of a, a disadvantage, to be honest, a disadvantage that I'm willing to accept as a member of a democracy, um, but a disadvantage nonetheless. The second piece of this is you know, there are all of these kind of financing instruments that uh, every country really uses. You know, there's uh, in the U.S. we have something called the Export-Import Bank that finances the sale of commercial products to foreign companies. This is a great example. This is how Boeing sells their aircraft to foreign airlines. Um, the U.S. government it finances those purchases on behalf of Boeing. Um, there's also foreign military sales and foreign mil military financing that's coordinated out of the State Department. Um, Europe has a, a similar uh, structure under the European Development Bank. Um, and then China uh, is doing this broadly as part of its Belt and Road Initiative. Um, so when they are going in to do infrastructure projects in developing countries, they don't just go in and say, here's money. They actually bring Chinese companies into these projects. Um, and they say, you want a cellular network? We're going to sell you a bunch of equipment from Huawei. Um, you want cameras for security? We're going to sell you Hikvision and Dawa. You want facial recognition technologies uh, for your law enforcement community? We're going to sell you SenseTime and Face++. Plus Plus. And most of these companies that they're selling um, into these, these infrastructure deals are startups. They're you know, new venture-backed companies. Um, oftentimes, sometimes, uh, actually U.S. venture capital firms backing these companies that, uh, that are part of the military, civil military fusion uh, network in China. We are not doing that. If you look at FMF, uh, foreign military financing, foreign military sales, uh, Export-Import Bank, um, over 80% of all money that flows out of those institutions go to the big five primes. Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Northrop Grumman, General Dynamics, uh, and then you have some uh, some additional ones that are British companies like BAE Systems, Rolls-Royce. Um, but basically, they've become banks for the largest companies. And there's n almost none of that money is going into supporting the innovative companies that are, that are working in these critical areas of national security. Um, and that is something that I'm actually pretty significantly concerned about. Stephanie? Yeah, Trey, that was a good segue for one question, specifically um, dealing with our current environment of COVID. Um, someone wrote in that AF Works just had the J20.1 cohort dedicated to dual use technology and COVID change their plan. One major change was that the VCs were not showing up, so forcing them to kind of reconfigure. Is Do you all see that VC investment is going to be an option for national security companies post COVID? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I, I very much do. Um, I think that uh, the, if you look at what's happening in the investing landscape right now, it is not slowed down. Uh, there was a minor blip in March in which people looked at, you know, a 30% decline in the stock market and said, okay, this is going to be really horrible. And now they're looking at the stock market and saying, okay, it's, it's, it's game on, it's time to keep going. And so we actually haven't seen a, a major decline in private investment. Um, and that means that, you know, I think, that doesn't that's going to have the same effect on investing in defense technology one thing that i do think is happening is people are looking around and saying actually it looks like there's more geopolitical risk and a lot more you know geopolitical worries right now and that actually might be a, a thing that leads more investors to look at defense as a sector that they can invest in um so i'm very hopeful that you know post covid we're actually going to see this the same level of investment if not more in artificial intelligence and, and areas related to, to defense well, and you'd have to say relative to some sectors uh, that have been very hard hit, like travel and hospitality, 
uh, defense is an area that uh, continues to have very uh, solid, sustainable demand. So on a relative basis, uh, you have to see an improvement. Everybody knows that that um, area of spending will, will continue. And given what we talked about earlier in terms of commercial technology being such a small part of defense and needing to be a larger part, there should be a growing opportunity in defense for dual use companies over the next decade. Nothing for me. I defer to Mike and Catherine. Um, one kind of snarky response to this is that uh, actually COVID wouldn't be, isn't the problem in that question. Um, the problem in the question is AFWorks went from spending just over $100 million a year in SBIR funding to over $400 million in SBIR funding in 2019, so from 2018 to 2019. If none of those contracts convert to production use cases and, and the companies that are getting that funding don't end up being worth anything in the, in the private market, that will cause the venture capital community to run away, to Catherine's earlier point. You can't just dole out like, you know, a million hundred thousand dollar contract um, so that every seed may bloom. Um, the goal is we have to pick champions. We have to pick winners. And uh, the only way that venture capital is going to participate is if there are winners that change the outcomes of their fund. Stephanie. Yep. Uh, what does the panel see as the impact of expanded export controls and CFI US, Committee of Foreign Investment on US, requirements on the startup environment? Taking funding can trigger significant compliance responsibilities for startups and can restrict access to foreign talent and foreign capital. Um, Mike, so I, built I, for you. On, <laughs> I serve on the Export Control Committee, and I would say the inside view uh, is um, is one where export controls are so complicated, the overhead to comply is so high. I think it does disadvantage uh, small companies, um, and there have been, you know, historically a lot of ideas for how to create a more level playing field. One is just to have fewer export controls, but enforce those export controls with much more diligence. So sort of the, um, I think it was a Bob Gates line about, you know, having smaller yards, but uh, but taller fences. Um, and I, I think that's right. Um, I think we should have a shorter list of things that we're export controlling. We should be really understanding the supply chains and what are the key places that we wanna make sure that we, um, we have some level of key influence. Um, so for example, you know, semiconductor manufacturing equipment, EDA design tools, possibly DNA synthesis uh, equipment. Um, on, the, on the compliance side, I think we really should be thinking about how we provide uh, credits for companies um, to comply. That is, uh, be able to compensate them for the, the legal fees that are required so that we're not disadvantaging them. Um, that is something that's been proposed before, and I think I think it's really worth exploring the policy side of that. Over. Yeah, I would just add that uh, Jason's very involved uh, working with the AI Commission, and we had a conversation recently about how do you apply these smartly? Because I think there's no question that, uh, in the general sense, if you have any export controls at all, it could be viewed as a dampening effect. But the key is how do you do those smartly so you have the uh, smallest effect and, and do the smart thing to, to still protect national security. So I think there's some good conversations happening to uh, ensure that there was some reform done on both CFIUS and export controls that was passed in 2018. Because government moves slowly, they still have not been uh, incorporated fully by Treasury and Commerce, but that's happening now. But the good news is trying to get some input to make sure that we do those uh, those smartly. and then. What we need to do is harmonize those export controls and investment screening for CFIUS with our allies, a uh, very important part of this equation that Jason talked about earlier. The key strength that the US has, one of the key strengths strategically is that $80 trillion of GDP combined with all our allies around the globe. So these um, uh, restrictions that we wanna put in place need to be harmonized so that we have a free trading block among those allies, even if we're gonna have some restrictions relative to adversaries like China, Russia, North Korea. Stephanie, it looks like we probably have time for one more question. 
Yep, there's a one pretty pretty general one that I think can lead to some interesting conversation. What type of innovations in AI specifically do you foresee in the next few decades? Uh, one that we're worried about is um, AI's application to um, cyber weapons and just the development of, of cyber weapons that are uh, that are built on tops of, of large models that allow them to evade a lot of more traditional uh, defensive tools. Um, so either accelerate the process of vulnerability discovery or defense evasion. Um, we have a, a project at, at Georgetown uh, called Cyber AI led by Ben Buchanan um, and uh, John Bansimer um, who have been, they both, I think, convinced me that this is one of the areas where we're going to see some pretty dramatic improvements uh, in the short run. Um, the one thing that I worry about is that other countries, not the United States, but other countries will be more tempted uh, to embed various forms of autonomy into nuclear command and control. We've seen early expressions of this in the Russian perimeter system. Uh, that makes me very anxious. Um, I was uh, Jack Shanahan is somebody I really admire, and and he's described that some of the that's one of the things that really worries him as well. I think that's that's a place that the United States has no interest in going, but that's not true of all of our competitors. Yeah. An area that that's sort of the intersection of defense and media that that we've been spending time looking at is deep fakes. And you know, I think initially, maybe a year or two ago, when when kind of proliferation of a lot of experimentation with deep fakes were happening online, there was a, a kind of fury that this could be, you know, the the ultimate weapon in terms of being able to build propaganda and use it against you know certain countries or populations. And I think there's sort of been a movement towards this actually could lead to just greater skepticism of all media and all types of propaganda. Uh, so I think you know we're definitely going to see the proliferation of deep fakes, but it might lead to a change in consumer behavior and even you know media consumption where, where people are just much more skeptical of the information they're taking taking in online. Yep, I think those are great examples. Okay. Great. Well, we are we are right at time, uh, at least by my judgment. Um, thank you, Mike. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Jason, for taking the time today. Stephanie, for all of the operational work that you did to make this happen. We, we really appreciate it. Um, and to everyone watching, uh, most likely from home and not at the hilltop, uh, I hope that you'll all be able to show back up at, on campus in the fall with a reasonably normal life. Um, but for now, goodbye and thank you for your time. Take care, everybody. Yes. Okay. Bye-bye.